Yes, hello. Okay. Hi. Then I start to share the more. Share my window. So this is not the window I want to share. Yes, this one. <clears throat> Can you see my PPT now? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Okay, to the play mode. Hi, everyone. Oh. Yeah, hello, everyone. Yeah, so I would like to thank Paula and uh, James for the kind of invitation to this uh, nice CNS workshop. And I would like to take this opportunity to share. Uh, with you our recent work on the analysis of the or modeling of the relation between the structural network and functional connectivity in the brain. And I want to show you that uh, the hierarchical, like modular architecture of the uh, structural network and uh, the critical state in the dynamic uh, jointly maximize this uh, we call functional diversity in the uh, functional connectivity or functional interaction, which may provide another like perspective to what uh, Paula just described, very rich spatial temporal uh, dynamics in form of uh, uh, wave. And this work was done with a few colleagues from a, a different university in mainland of China and has been published in this physical science journal, physical review letter. Uh, so here is a, a brief outline of my talk. First, I will give some introduction on the, uh, especially emphasizing on the hierarchical modular organization of the brain network and the emphasize on the balance of uh, 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 segregation and integration. And I will talk about how we categorize the functional uh, diversity and uh, introduce the critical state of the brain and then also this method of again modes. And then I will show uh, the main results of this work. So in our brain, we have a very complex network uh, of different levels and the whole brain can be divided into a few functional uh, systems and uh, then within the functional system, we have different functional areas and uh, within the area, we have this cortical, like a coulomb, mini coulomb. So this is a, a very pronounced like a modular architecture and especially across uh, uh, many levels. So even at this uh, interregional level, and you can see that you ha we have clearly this kind of modular architecture. The uh, connection between those functional areas within the same functional system uh, are much denser, and then connection between these functional subsystems are uh, sparser. So globally, the whole brain is very sparse, but locally we have dense connection. Yeah, And then uh, these kind of functional subsystems are also spatially in the neighborhood. So dense connection are local. Here. So why the brain want to have uh, this kind of organization? I think this is a, a, a kind of a substrate for a, the important functional requirement of our brain to have a segregated processing of or specialized processing of uh, different uh, like sensory modality, and then later uh, through this uh, uh, fast processing within one particular system or module, then these different uh, information will be integrated to uh, achieve higher order like uh, function uh, cognition. So when you have a, a segregated processing, then you don't want to be interfered too much by the other systems. Therefore, the connection between the different modules should be uh, sparser. So uh, since uh, I came to do the research like about 15 years ago to do this large scale modeling of a brain network of a, like a cat cortex, I think, or analysis of the network, I, I really uh, interested in this kind of balance of uh, segregation and, and integration in this network. So when we uh, model this uh, catacortical network, we pay attention to how these functional modules can emerge from the underlying like structural modules and uh, at different coupling uh, parameters. And uh, when we look at this architecture of the of the network, you can see. Uh, these functional subsystems are linked by a kind of highly connected that we call hyper community so that uh, this segregated processing in principle can be integrated and processed uh, in a uh, integrative manner and uh, later uh, uh, colleagues would like to call this uh, from so, uh, social science network like a rich club and publish many papers on that and our recent analysis of the 
monkey cortical network shows that this kind of organization with a lot of uh, dense connection uh, uh, within the functional system, which are also spatially like uh, segregated, uh, and uh, with uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, hyper community, is uh, cost efficient. And especially you have a few areas like uh, taking most of this long range connection in this network. And uh, they are uh, responsible for this uh, communication and uh, interaction of these segregated uh, functional modules. So, but the, the functional segregation and integration, this is just the structure substrate, but they actually should be realized by the dynamic pro pro dynamical process. Then we turn to uh, talk about the dynamical property, like uh, Paula just mentioned that it's a fairly complex, rich dynamic. And uh, I think uh, there's another perspective to see that this dynamic can be organized in the so-called uh, avalanche. So when people put the electrode array on the surface of cortex, you will observe this kind of fluctuating local field potential and actually reflecting the spiking of the neurons. And if you take a threshold, you can talk about activation of uh, this electro and this kind of activation is propagating in the form of uh, avalanche. So that you can see like many actually activate together. So if you measure the size of this avalanche, it has a power law distribution. So in physics, a power law means uh, the system is uh, at the critical state, but you don't have to uh, uh, fine tune any parameter to achieve this critical state. So this is called self-organized criticality. So like an earthquake is happening in the brain constant. And this is not just the property at the microscopic like uh, electro array, you can go to the whole brain, like uh, here is the uh, voltage imaging of the whole uh, mouse cortex. And uh, when the mouse uh, is uh, recovering from anesthesia, you can see that uh, the avalanche size distribution go to this power law, uh, which is the same as the awake state. So this is a for the uh, resting state, but if you could even go to like a task state when the animal is given like a, a, a visual uh, signal and then the system will be kicked away temporarily from the resting state, then it will restore this kind of a power law uh, critical state. And the uh, mouse brain is very small. And here we have uh, the largest uh, like uh, uh, brain of a human we know. And uh, Paula just mentioned fMR. You have very complex spatial temporal dynamics, but you, you, you can uh, do the analysis from this perspective of avalanche by thresholding the activity, and then you see this uh, super, uh, like a threshold activity propagated like a cluster. And if you measure the size of a cluster again, it's a kind of a power law, very nice power law distribution, and together with some other property, you can confirm again the brain, or even for this uh, uh, very huge uh, the human brain at the resting state in the normal uh, uh, healthy young uh, subject is at the critical state. So all this uh, shows that the uh, uh, kind of critical state is kind of basic uh, uh, working mode of our brain. But this is not uh, surprising since uh, when the system is at the critical state, you have uh, a lot of advantages for information processing. For example, a circuit uh, sitting at the critical state, copper uh, at one, uh, will have a proper response to very weak or very strong perturbation so that uh, this so-called dynamical range will be maximized. If you use drug to drive the system away from the criticality, like go to over inhibit or over excite state, you cannot have such a, a nice property. And uh, also this activation pattern of different electrodes can be used to uh, uh, present, represent like a signal uh, or coding information. So this capacity or information coding capacity is maximized, or the entropy is maximized at, at the critical state. When different neural tissues are involved in this kind of propagating like avalanche, then they form uh, interaction temporally or synchronization. But then when they are uh, from, not from the same avalanche, then they uh, desynchronize uh, temporally. So this kind of uh, transition between synchrony and the desynchrony is the most flexible. And all these properties similar to what uh, Paula mentioned, it's uh, very important for the neural system to have a very flexible and uh, kind of a response to, to the constantly changing environment. So this is uh, uh, the advantage of these uh, complex dynamics. 
So theoretically, it is uh, still not really well understood how the neural system can join this kind of critical state and to self-organize at this kind of state, and especially when the network is so complicated. So I myself has been also working on this question. But today I want to uh, uh, ask another question. So this kind of hierarchical, very pronounced hierarchical modular architecture, and uh, this is a very uh, uh, clear, like a critical uh, state when they are working together, I mean, actually they are happening um, together in the brain, so what would be the functional value? So here I want to show you that uh, the combination of this kind of architecture and the, the dynamical states can maximize the diversity in our functional interaction, and then this will allow the system to have uh, segregation or segregated processing or integrated processing across many levels. So here the method we used uh, to do this uh, um, uh, study is a combination of uh, some simple dynamical model with the analysis of evermore data. And uh, we also use eigenmodes, eigenvalue of this uh, uh, network Laplacian uh, to uh, understand how this complexity emerges from this structure. So now let me come to introduce how we characterize this uh, functional diversity or earlier people call neuron complexity. So when a neuron circuit are coupled, and the coupling will induce this ability of integration. But then you hope like uh, some subsystem can be relatively like uh, segregated or in relatively independent from others. And uh, you need a kind of balance of segregation and integration, and that was called that like, neuron complexity. So here I want to introduce a simple but the intuitive measure of a neuron complexity from uh, the functional connectivity or interaction between or correlation between the uh, 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 neuron population. Yeah. So when we have a network, when we couple them, suppose we have a, a, a parameter to uh, to tune like coupling strengthen. When the coupling is very weak, then there's no inter uh, 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 interaction. The interaction is very weak, and then uh, the, the neuron populations are relatively independent. So they are segregated. There's no no integration. So in this case. The pairwise correlation value would be close to zero. The distribution would be very sharp around zero. On the other hand, if we increase the coupling strength to a very large value, so the whole network is like a vibrating, very uh, uh, strongly synchronized in a synchronized way. So then this is like operating like a, as a single unit. So then the subsystem cannot uh, do something sep separately. Sec there's no segregation. So what we need is uh, something in between, right? Uh, we want to have some part of the of the neuron correlation are strong so that they can do kind of a segregated processing of local processing, but then those segregated processing then can be linked to the other part relatively weakly, so you still can maintain this integration. So what we need is somewhere in between that like, the distribution of the correlation should be broad enough. So we can use this broadness uh, of this uh, correlation distribution in the functional connectivity as the, the measure of the diversity. Uh, and uh, you can use entropy, or here we measure the uh, uh, distance from the uniform distribution. And then when we put a dynamical model, for example, a simple a lean, uh, Gaussian linear process on different like, neural network, and we indeed found that at the intermediate coupling, you have a maximal uh, complexity. And uh, interestingly, when you compare real network to many uh, different like a uh, 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 rewind network. For example, you try to make the uh, module stronger and uh, segregation becomes stronger, or you make the connection between modules stronger and integration becomes stronger. You always reduce the complexity compared to the real network. So the in in, in the cell against cat and the macaco human brain, you will see the uh, this property common. So. The real network has the kind of optimal uh, diversity. Now I want to, uh, in this talk, I want to uh, tell you uh, possibly the reason for that. So here the idea is that we use the eigenmode analysis. So eigenmode from uh, uh, physics, like a crystal uh, lattice, and these items are coupled, and from the geometry of coupling, we can compute this so-called vibration mode, and that gives you a lot of understanding of the physical property or the function, like the acoustic and thermal property. And uh, here is an illustration if I have two sphere coupled by a spring in between, then this coupling matches, then I can go to the Laplacian matches. Laplacian, you, 
you, you go from a network to dynamic process, like a sequence. And then when you do the eigenmode analysis, you get the eigenvector. So the first eigenvector means the two spheres are moving together. And the second eigenvector, these two are orthogonal, uh, and the two spheres will move in the opposite way. Then the idea of eigenvalue and eigenmode analysis is that any natural movement will be the combination, can be described as the combination of these two eigenmodes. So when you apply this idea to the, the, the network of the brain, then this eigenmode has the meaning that uh, it is the activation pattern in the system, uh, supported by the underlying, underlying network architecture. And the eigenvalue, actually this, the reciprocal of the eigenvalue uh, is uh, the has the meaning that it is the lifetime of the mode activated. So this idea has been already uh, applied to study like a functional subnetwork organization and the disease spreading in the field of uh, connected. So in order to uh, link the structure to function, so we uh, apply a simple uh, Gaussian linear model. So although the dynamic is highly nonlinear and uh, critical, but we use a linear uh, equation like coupling different brain areas. So this is the structural connectivity from the uh, diffusion tensor imaging. And uh, in order to uh, model this highly friable dynamic, we, we put locally some noise. And then uh, the coupling strengthening can change when you change and then you induce uh, the correlation between different brain areas. And this is called the functional uh, uh, model functional connectivity. And then when you change the coupling, this model functional connectivity will be different. Then when uh, we can compare this functional connectivity from uh, the real fMR data, and then we can get some understanding why the brain is organized uh, in this way, the dynamic. So now let me come to the results quickly. Uh, first, we confirm that the brain is really act, uh, working at the critical state, and uh, we go to different resolution and compute this avalanche size, and you see they all are uh, uh, power law distribution, and uh, they can pass this uh, very strict KS test. And then not only the, the avalanche size distribution, the duration distribution, and the relation between the avalanche duration and the size, they all follow this kind of power law function, and then uh, according to the statistical physics, the critical state, the exponent uh, should follow this kind of relationship and we confirm that, that it's satisfied. So the brain is really uh, working at the critical state. So when we go to compare the model with the data, when we increase the coupling, you can see that the average correlation of the model will increase, that you go from asynchronized to strongly synchronized state. And in between you pass this uh, point, uh, this is the value of the real functional connectivity from fMR. And at this uh, point, you can see like uh, the real system is something in between uh, compared to the model at the transition from asynchronous or to synchronous or from segregated or to very strongly integrated state, something in between. And now at this critical point, you also can compare this, this uh, functional connectivity matrix from the uh, uh, model and the real data and they, they are very similar. Actually, the, the, the distance is minimized. I already show you that uh, for different resolution, you have a power law distribution, and from the model, you can also see with the coupling uh, strengthening, you go through this kind of power law distribution. So the distance between this uh, power law distribution or this uh, avalanche size distribution from the model and the real data is also minimized. So this result shows you that the brain, the real brain compared to this model, is really sitting at the kind of a transition. Uh, state of the dynamical uh, system and uh, is at the critical state. And this model, although it's very simple, can recover many properties of this functional connectivity. For example, how this uh, functional connectivity decay with uh, distance in the model and in the real data. Now I come to uh, show you the eigenmodes analysis. So this is uh, the analysis based on the structural connectivity. So the first uh, mode uh, uh, didn't show here is a uniform. It's a uh, corresponding to the global sequence. And then when you come to the second mode, the second mode, uh, you can see some of the components are positive value and the other components are negative value. And uh, very interestingly, when we group them together, we found that uh, the negative and the positive value of the components correspond to the two hemispheres, the left and right hemisphere. So this shows that uh, under uh, suitable condition, the two hemispheres can uh, be segregated. 
And these uh, people already found in some uh, special condition, for example, when you travel, and in the first night you to a, a new place, you, you sleep, and then half of your brain can sleep deeper, and the other half is not so deep. So this is somewhat like basing on the possibility, like uh, from the structure, the two hemispheres can indeed be segregated in the eigen mode. Now we have uh, develop, uh, developed in this work a kind of a hierarchical uh, modular uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, detection. When I fix this uh, left hemisphere, I go to the next eigen mode. And then again, you see the negative and positive value and you group them together. And uh, nicely, they correspond to the like anterior, posterior brain. And then you go further, the frontal part, you see again the the, the next mode, like positive and negative, and you can further divide the brain into uh, two, uh, the frontal part, two parts. So you can continue this process up to the uh, uh, moment that like you divide the whole brain into like the separated areas, and then you have a hierarchy. And then if I label, uh, when, when I come to that point, and I label the brain areas, and then plot this adjacent matrix, you see very nicely like that you have clearly the underlying connectivity within different levels of a module, they are denser within the module and the sparser uh, between the module. And then this is a very uh, uh, evident uh, hierarchical modular architecture in the network. And this kind of partition is a very robust when you go to different resolution, like when you divide the brain into this region of interest or uh, more closer, like a functional perceptation. And this kind of hierarchical partition, actually you also give uh, uh, you find a segregation of the functional sub subsystem. For example, the default mode system, people usually treat them as a, like a subsystem, but actually, uh, according to this kind of division, you can go uh, to uh, different levels. And uh, especially you can have like a, a anterior default mode system or posterior, people already found that can be activated in different tasks, uh, like a quantum process, processing. And also in disease, these different subsystems can be targeted uh, different. Now I come to this uh, diversity. Uh, this is the real functional connectivity from FMR, and you see many uh, different like uh, modules. And when we go to do the distribution of the correlation value, and you see it's a very broad distribution and uh, from zero to one, and actually there's a kind of little uh, small uh, number of negative values. Now, from the model, I already mentioned that if you have a very weak coupling, then the uh, brain areas are uh, relatively independent and the correlation value uh, is around zero. If the coupling is very strong, the correlation value, like you see the right color, will be close to one. And in between where we have the coincidence between the model and the, the real brain on average, then you see this kind of plot distribution. So we can measure this diversity as uh, the similarity to a uniform distribution. And uh, this diversity, you can see when we increase the coupling G, this diversity achieve a maximum value where the real and the uh, model uh, network are very similar. And actually, this measure uh, of the functional diversity from the real data is also very close to the maximum value of the model. So from this comparison, we can see like a kind of a revolution, try to put the brain to maximize this kind of functional diversity. And, uh, and uh, now I'm uh, uh, going to uh, show you how we can understand this uh, emergence of this diversity by the eigen modes. So eigen modes, as we mentioned, is, can be considered as the basic like, activation mode and uh, the uh, dynamic can be considered as a combination of, of the mode, yeah? So when we add, go to different coupling, we can look at the dynamic and see how these modes are activated differently. And when we go to these different modes of activation, you see there's a kind of a maximum for each mode to be activated. When coupling is very small, only some very localized modes are activated. When coupling becomes larger and some more large scale coherent modes are activated. So this is the critical value here with the maximal diversity. So here you see the, this special value at the critical state will give you the moment that uh, all the available modes are activated kind of a maximum. So this is the point that all potential 
uh, internal modes are activated as much as possible. So this is the meaning of the criticality in the system. And uh, so this criticality, uh, this uh, potential is from the structure. Those eigen modes are determined totally from the connectivity, uh, structural connectivity. But then, what kind of a structure will give you the kind of a high capacity, yeah, high potential for the dynamics uh, combination? So here I want to emphasize that uh, the hierarchy I showed you is very important. We can go to destroy this hierarchy in a model. For example, I go to randomize the connection within the hemisphere, but they keep the connection between the hemisphere. So you have a kind of two modules in the network or I can completely randomize the whole brain. Actually, I can do, go to do this kind of a randomization at different levels. So if you do so, what you observe is uh, this maximal diversity will decrease. Actually, for random network, this uh, complexity is very small. And uh, the activation of these modes will be also uh, reduced. And you can see this maximal diversity or the range, this kind of parameter range for the larger diversity also decrease when you go to the one network to become totally random. And uh, for the real brain, the transition to synchronization is uh, very slow, and uh, for a random network is very fast because the eigenvalue in the structure, in the, in the structure, is uh, very continuous for the uh, real brain, but for random network is kind of a jump. This means in a random network you just basically have the either asynchronized or strongly synchronized state or too much segregated or too much uh, 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 integrated. You don't have something very very nicely like in the brain in between you have broad range of parameters can allow segregation and integration. Yeah. So that's the main results but I just tried to link to some previous work I people look at the, the functional organization or disease and found a very interesting correspondence between disease and the normal brain. So this is uh, uh, the work, uh, I, I don't know whether you can see because I see here it's a hidden by a, a window here. Uh, published in Neuron, two papers, they show that uh, a subtype of uh, this uh, dementia actually corresponds to the atrophy of uh, different uh, brain networks. And the very interesting thing is uh, uh, if you go back to the normal people, look at these the intrinsic functional connectivity, so those uh, brain areas later will have a trophy is actually a kind of functional uh, a cluster in the functional network. And also those areas, they covary in close individuals. So some of the like uh, green matters, they change uh, uh, together these brain areas, these subnetworks. So you have a, within the brain, you have a subnetworks, they are working together and then they can get a problem together. And yeah. So I think this is a, a kind of a, like a reflection that like you have different uh, hierarchy of uh, modules in, inside the network. And another work is already uh, considered these eigen modes to be related to the disease because in uh, neuron degenerative disease, some disease agent like, like uh, amyloid beta can spread in the network, on the brain network. And that spreading is uh, described by the eigen modes. And this work shows that uh, the second eigen mode uh, uh, seems corresponds to the AD, and the third eigen mode corresponds to another like subtype of the dementia. And then this eigen value actually corresponds to the percentage of the disease in the population. Yeah. So this is a very interesting, I think, association between this kind of a dynamical concept to the disease and to the function. So now I come to the summary of my work I showed you. Uh, that the, the brain uh, organized at the critical state is kind of a healthy normal brain state organized at the critical state and we use a, a solid like statistical measures to confirm that and at this critical state you can see this kind of functional interaction or the diversity is maximized and this is because uh, this critical state has the special property to activate uh, this internal inherent modes which are offered by this underlying structural substrate. And then this substrate can provide the high potential if you have a hierarchical organization. So from this kind of results, we could conclude that uh, 
it is the combination of this kind of hierarchical modular architecture and uh, the dynamical uh, critical state jointly maximize the functional interaction and diversity and underlying this kind of spatial temporal pattern like Paula just showed us. So this suggests that uh, in the evolution and we have uh, the optimization of the brain both in structure and the dynamics and uh, this kind of uh, optimization or diversity when you consider uh, uh, the different uh, networks like they can form clusters to form segregation and then these different clusters can be integrated to ha have a higher level of organization then you have many levels so if you go to this level of neurons and then you have even more and uh, it seems like a uh, normal function and disease are together like happening on this kind of hierarchical modular architecture i hope this can provide the kind of uh, uh, perspective to study function and disorder together. So finally, I thank you and thank to my uh, collaborators and the funding agents for the support. Thank you. Thank you, Shangsong. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're sort of out of time, but we'll quickly do question two. So, yeah, uh, that's time, yeah. yeah, that's why right. Uh, so, is the number of eigenmodes to be combined in the Gaussian model achieve to achieve the highest correlation between SC and FC subject specific? And how do you determine how many eigenmodes are to be included in the model? Yeah, I think the eigenmode uh, the conversation, the number of eigenmodes is actually the dimension of the system. Say, if you have uh, uh, ninety areas, then you have ninety modes, right? And if you have uh, 1024 region of interest you have uh, 1024 uh, uh, modes and uh, the largest modes are very similar but then when you have a higher resolution you have a more like a smaller and a smaller modes and, yeah uh, and did you use for the uh, <laughs> if the eigenmodes did you use a linear combination of the eigenmodes of the SC or do you also combine that with a dynamical model? Asked Katarina. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're, the idea is uh, when you talk about the dynamic, then the dynamic can be decomposed as a combination of like modes. And then we can see uh, how much each uh, mode com contributed to, that, to the dynamic. And this kind of activation um, I was talking about, when you increase the coupling, then you go to activate different modes and the the combination. So what I said is at the critical state, all the modes are very strongly activated so that you have a, 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 a very rich combination from that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Shrey, your, your question will have to go <laughs> to the after session. So um, it's, thanks, Chang Song, again. And uh, yeah, I, I, I stopped.